Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another Diabetes Action Canada webinar. I will introduce myself. My name is Tracy McGuire, and I'm with Diabetes Action Canada. And I am pleased to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Monica Kastner. Monica is the research chair for knowledge translation and implementation at North York General Hospital. She's an associate professor in the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto and an affiliate scientist in the knowledge translation program at the Lee K. Shing Knowledge Institute at St. Michael's Hospital. Today, we were going to be discussing or pre presenting the first of a series of knowledge translation webinars that we are going to be doing both today at the end of 2021 and well into 2022. Based on the feedback we received today and after, we will be planning further webinars and workshops based on the needs of what the Diabetes Action Canada community has told us they need in terms of their knowledge mobilization. Uh, we have a couple of ground rules for today's webinar. We ask that all questions be asked in the question and answer box as opposed to the chat, because it is hard for us to monitor both the chat and the question and answer. The link to the slides in both French and English has been posted in the chat. Uh, this will also be circulated widely after today's um, webinar. And today's webinar is recorded and will be available for viewing after. So we will send out this information as a during our post uh, webinar thank you and follow up. So I will set, pass the floor over to Monica to please start today's webinar. Great, thank you so much for the introductions, Tracy. <clears throat> and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining this webinar. So uh, what we hope that you'll take away from today's webinar is really to, to be able to define knowledge trans translation and related concepts. To describe um, why knowledge translation or KT is important in health research and to really be able to understand the different KT activities that can be embedded within health research to ensure that the results that we produce are used and applied. So let's start with what is knowledge translation. So there's a ton of uh, different terms to describe knowledge translation. It's actually quite an overused term with about 100 synonyms, which really does make uh, conducting KT research a little bit challenging. And I'm sure that you've seen some of these uh, terms being described for knowledge translation. Um, everything from reach, research utilization, dissemination and diffusion, knowledge transfer, and, and so forth. Um, and more recently, knowledge translation and implementation, that sort of phrase has been used a lot in Canada. Uh, knowledge mobilization, in fact, has been uh, the, the term that's being more used now by CIHR. And it's really an umbrella term that includes a wide range of activities related to both to production as well as the use of research results. Another term that's commonly used in the United States is dissemination and implementation. And this is referred to as evidence-based practices, interventions and policies, which are effectively translated to and used in real world settings, similar to hospitals, other organizations, schools and communities. And this is a definition that came from the National Institutes of Health in the US. Another um, term that's being used um, actually in the US, Canada, <clears throat> as well as in the UK is a term implementation science. And this is really around studying the methods that we use for that systematic uptake of the research findings um, into routine practice and ultimately to improve the quality and effectiveness of health uh, services. So what is the de definition of KT then? So our um, Canadian Institutes of Health Research or CIHR defines the KT as a dynamic and iterative process that it includes the synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge, ultimately to improve the health of Canadians, provide more effective health services and products, and to strengthen the healthcare system. So as you can imagine, this is a very tall order. 
Um, but ultimately, I think the, the most important thing to remember with KT is that it's the bridge between what we know and what we do. It's actually moving those research results into practice and policy and helping researchers, clinicians, patients, policy makes, makers make better decisions. So it's all about decision making. I love this, this quote by Anton Chekhov, who's a, a, a Russian playwright. Um, knowledge is of no value unless you put it into practice. And I can't think of a better way to phrase what knowledge, what knowledge translation is, is and why it's important. So why is knowledge translation important? So unfortunately, at this point, it takes us about 17 years to get research results into practice, which is a staggering statistic. And so no wonder that we still have care gaps and, and we're not able to do what we're trying to accomplish. And we work so hard to develop that discovery knowledge, but we're not getting it into practice. What knowledge translation and implementation science can do is actually reduce that time to about one to five years, which is a very exciting thing, um, but it's something that, that we need to work very hard at to make sure that we do get that knowledge into practice. So then ultimately KT science is really around understanding the best way to share, apply, sustain and scale knowledge. We need to understand the context or the setting in which the knowledge is implemented. We need to understand what motivates people um, to behave the way they do. So everything from practice, the way they, they develop and implement policies, everything, what, what is the motivation? And we also need to identify the opportunities to enable that change and behavior change. We also have to focus on not just the, the, the barriers and challenges, but we also have to identify the strengths uh, of, 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 of that knowledge being implemented and how we can leverage that strength. A lot of, a lot of groups don't even realize what, what's working well. So being aware of what's working well and then leveraging them is, is equally uh, powerful and important. How to collaborate effectively in research is really important, especially in terms of engaging and empowering our knowledge users. So the people that will use the knowledge that we produce to, to be able to participate in research. So that empowerment and engagement is a very important part of knowledge translation. So another reason that knowledge translation is so important is, and I was alluding, alluding to this earlier, is that we do produce too much discovery knowledge. So I'm not saying that we don't need discovery knowledge. I think it's very important, but we, we don't have enough um, implementation trials to be able to deliberately drive that change. We tend to develop uh, pilot projects that don't lead anywhere, and then it, it becomes, um, it, it stagnates. So, Again, like I think it's very important that alongside the research that we do, we need to have studies that actually deliberately and systematically implement those innovations that we have found to be effective, because this is what will actually inform practice and policy decisions. So this all leads to this idea of research waste. Um, back in, um, uh, 2007 and eight, there was a staggering statistic that came out that we waste about 85% of, of that global investment in research. And this, this is absolutely crazy. So why is this happening? We often uh, you know, reproduce um, data or research when it's not needed or implemented or, or spread it before it's tested. Um, and again, this lack of implementation of that knowledge that we produce contributes to that waste. That deliberate and systematic approach to driving change is also something that's lacking. And I think it's all part of knowledge translation that I will describe in, in just one moment. So the care gaps that I mentioned continue and persist uh, because we don't use evidence to inform practice policy decisions. And this is seen across the board. We know that a third of patients don't get the treatments of proven effectiveness. And a quarter of patients actually um, get care that is not recommended or potentially harmful. And this is where the whole science of de-implementation has come to light because this is a very important problem. 
In terms of decision making, up to three quarters of patients, up to half of healthcare professionals don't have the information to make the best decisions. And even policymakers are not consistently accessing and using evidence for decision making. So another problem is that our innovations, interventions, programs, practices, or policies don't always implement what they're supposed to implement as intended. So this is that whole idea of fidelity. Is it working or is it implemented the way that we had intended for it to be used? It doesn't always involve all target audiences or what I call the knowledge users in the development or implementation of those innovations. We don't always monitor implementation quality, so the way we're actually implementing it. And we don't always evaluate outcomes. And again, the sustainability, which I will get into in a little bit more detail, is also a problem. We don't develop these innovations with sustainability in mind. So then what this boils down to is, what are those different KT activities? So let's unpack this a little bit more. So, I'm sure that a lot of you have heard of um, the dissemination and implementation, which is often thought of, I think, mostly when, when someone thinks of knowledge translation. But I wanted to really illustrate to, to you the spectrum of activities that you can actually consider in knowledge translation that goes well beyond dissemination and implementation. So I will walk you through each of these now. So let's start with a term that we call integrated knowledge translation. So some of you may have heard of this. It's really a collaborative approach to doing research. It's bringing together all of the knowledge users, all of the knowledge creators during every stage of the research cycle. So we're talking about everything from developing research questions, finalizing objectives, selecting outcomes and methods for whatever you wanna do, actually conducting the research, data collection, data analysis, interpretation and dissemination of findings. So we're talking about from the beginning of the project all the way to the end. And I know I've been talking a lot about this term knowledge users. So these are the people that are interested in the research and they will also use the research results. So the, this could be a, a wide range of, of people. Typically, they tend to be patient partners, doctors, researchers, healthcare professionals, um, policy and decision makers, but it could be other, uh, other um, knowledge users as well. So we know that integrated KT is really important because we know and we have evidence to show that this active engagement of all knowledge users as partners. So this is the key, is that they are partners in the research. And right from the beginning, so from the beginning of, of con you know, conceptualizing about the problem all the way through to disseminating the knowledge, because it leads to more actionable research results, which is what we want. We want that increased uptake of the results. Um, it's going to result in more relevant um, uh, knowledge. So the people that will actually use it will be relevant for them and it will be used by them. Um, it also leads to this idea of the stronger and more robust science. So that means that if, if our methods are and, and, and we're, we're systematic about the way that we drive that change, it will likely more likely to lead to improved outcomes than if we don't. The sustained patient outcomes and key stakeholder relationships is a really important piece. By having everybody engaged right from the beginning, it's more likely that you will keep those stakeholder relationships um, there for, to, to carry it right through to the end. Um, and because there is this the collaboration will, will reveal a lot of these differing perspectives the expectations, the values, and all of these different things. It leads to this trust and the shared vision that actually drives the success of, of, of integrated KT. And so I think that the bottom line is that it is a fundamental aspect or activity in KT, and it should be embedded in the research process from, from the very beginning. So what is actually involved in practicing integrated KT? So usually we form KT teams uh, by identifying relevant knowledge users, 
again, who will be interested in will use the knowledge. And in the diabetes um, research world, this could be, of course, patients living with diabetes, healthcare providers that, that are involved in the care of, of these patients, nurses, dietitians, pharmacists, doctors, researchers, and policymakers. And typically these teams meet every three to four months or less, less or more, depending on the needs of the research project. So what happens at, at these meetings? And I'm not, not gonna dig into too much of these details, but just wanted to mention to you that it really depends on the trajectory and the, where you are in the project. So early on, we wanna establish those team roles, responsibilities, and it's all about planning. Planning is key for any um, uh, KT activity or any research activity. Um, midway through the, the project, monitoring progress is really important. You know, everything from timelines, data collection management, things like that. And really important to identify and address challenges so that you, you can deal with those along the way to ensure success. And then towards the end of the project, it's all about interpretation of and the meaning of the results. So what does this mean now? Where do you go? Where do we go from here? What are the next steps? And of course, this idea of, of actually implementing some sort of end of project of, or end of grant knowledge translation plan. And I'm going to uh, get into that in, in a, a little bit more in a second. So now that we've, we've talked about integrated KT, another really important activity is knowledge creation. So knowledge creation is really about synthesizing or combining research evidence on a particular topic, a disease, an intervention program, whatever that thing is that you're working on. And the, the key part of this is that you wanna have a totality of that evidence from a, 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 a worldview um, context from across the globe. You want to be able to see what that evidence shows from across the world. And then knowledge creation can also mean the creation of knowledge products using the research results or output. So some of the things that we may uh, look at synthesizing the evidence and then from that we may use the results to then create something a tool, an intervention, a program, or policy. So that's part of knowledge creation as well. So again, the knowledge product that I've been talking about is any innovation, intervention, tool, program, practice, policy. So another very important activity that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with is dissemination. And this is really about sharing or disseminating research results or knowledge products with knowledge users. So making them aware of the knowledge. And so this, this is what is actually referred to as end of grant or end of project KT plan that I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. And it's really about developing a plan at the very beginning of the research process and then executing that plan at the end of the project. And the nice thing about having a plan right from the beginning is that you can actually um, change that plan along the way or alter it or, or make it as, as you go along and, and you identify some of those potential challenges and mitigation strategies, it may also impact on the type of plan that you've started with and now you're adjusting towards the end of the project. And it's all about tailoring messages to knowledge users. So there's different levels of dissemination that I just wanted to make sure that I, I I show you the distinction between the two. The first is what we call passive dissemination. And we often talk about this as letting things happen. So this is largely this passive, unplanned, informal effort to spread and communicate information. There's really no customization here on the delivery mechanisms to reach your target audience. And it's really up to the knowledge user to seek out the information. So if they don't know about it, they, do, they may not be aware of what's really out there. So that's why what we really are aiming to do is more interactive dissemination or helping it happen. <clears throat> and so again, this is also called end of grant KT, and this is a more active approach. It's planned, it's more formal, it's centralized, and this is where tailoring may come in to be able to communicate those results and to be able to tailor the messages to the right audience and the context. 
So what do, we, what do we mean by these kinds of activities? So I'm gonna give you a few examples of like the passive dissemination strategy. So for example, personal contact, which we often do with colleagues is one um, example of, of a passive dissemination strategy. So as you can imagine, the person you're talking with and sharing that information, it may just stop there. So it's not the most effective way of getting information across. Publications, which we often, you know, you know, as, as researchers, this is our, our productivity measure, right? So this is something that we all do as trainees, as, as academics, um, as scientists. This is, this is one way that, that we can disseminate um, our, our results, as well as presentation. So we know that this is something we do, and it is effective to a certain point, but it's not enough. So um, what we really need to do is focus more on interactive dissemination strategies. So I think we need to also consider the passive ones. I'm not saying that you have to forego that altogether, but I think we also need to add additional interactive dissemination strategies. So what are some examples of that? So for example, infographics, and this is a perfect example that Diabetes Action Canada just recently developed, the do's and don'ts of, of engaging patient partners in research. This is a fantastic example of how co-creating a product like this could have such a huge impact, not just on patient partners, but healthcare providers and researchers. So this is a really great example of that, that fantastic collaboration that you can have of co-creating something with your knowledge users. And it's a very effective way of getting that information across. Plain language summaries are also really useful um, because they, they break down those key messages in a simple language, in a simple way that will summarize the, 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 those, those key aspects of the results of research. And it's very useful for um, a whole range of, of target audiences. And so I think this is also a very effective strategy. Decision aids and shared decision-making tools are also a really good example of a dissemination strategy as well as a knowledge translation tool. So in, in, in decision-making, especially shared decision-making could be very powerful because it considers the, the health priorities and goals of not only the clinicians, but also the patients. So it's this shared um, making of decisions for optimized care, which is really important. Another really good example is a clinical practice guideline. So clinical, there's, you know, guideline implementability is a whole other area that's a really challenging thing to do. And by creating um, clinical practice guideline tools, such as, for example, this particular website um, is, is a really great tool to be able to disseminate those, those, really, those key recommendations and messages that clinicians need to, to practice. So policy briefs is another example for, for that particular audience group, so for policymakers. And again, um, the tailoring of these messages across all of these different knowledge users has to be, has to be tailored to, to conform to what, how they prefer to receive that information, how they can best utilize and apply that information in the way that they do things. So that's why it's very important for us to pay attention to what these different knowledge users actually need to be able to use that information. So there's lots of other strategies that I'm not gonna dig into further, but just to let you know, there's, there's lots of really creative ways of being, of, of disseminating knowledge um, in an interactive way. Um, so I just wanted to uh, just, mentioned that there's lots of other ways other than the ones that I mentioned. So one way that we can facilitate this kind of um, um, more you know, deliberate and more systematic way of, of, of doing dissemination is to use a template such as this. Again, I'm not gonna get into the details, but it's just give you a, a, an idea that this is something that can actually be done as part of the integrated KT team they can actually, you know, one of the earlier meetings that they have, they can actually create such a plan. And this is an example of what that plan might look like. And as I said, it could evolve over time. 
And it's this kind of activity that, that we're hoping to do more workshops on later on to be able to engage teams in this kind of exercise so that they, they become more familiar about what's the best way of thinking through uh, developing such, such a plan. So now let's move on to another very important activity, which is implementation. So again, I think it's one of the, the more common KT activities that you may have heard about. And this is now about making it happen. So up to this point, we, we were looking at how you know, we can letting, let things happen, helping things happen, but implementation actually makes things happen. So this is where we can make those large impacts that we've been talking about. It's a more intensive, deliberate um, strategies to move that, that effective and impactful uh, research results into practice. It can involve actually conducting studies to be able to make implementation happen. So this is where we could uh, conduct some qualitative interviews, some surveys to figure out what are the factors that may influence implementation. And then using the results of that work, to then tailor make strategies that will actually get that result in, into action. So it's a more tailored communication of knowledge. And our goal with this particular activity is to actually have people use and apply that knowledge intervention, whatever that thing is that you're working on to be actually used in practice or policy. So just wanted to, I'm not gonna get into some of these um, models and frameworks in knowledge translation, but I wanted to just acknowledge that there are lots of different, even more so than these three, there's actually hundreds, which makes uh, practicing KT a little bit challenging. But these are some of the, the theories, models, and frameworks that we commonly use, and they're very well validated. But I just wanted to acknowledge that there are some of these that, are, that we can use as tools to help us practice you know, all of these different activities that I'm describing. So the next activity that I wanted to really uh, talk about is sustainability. So sustainability is essential. And it really, it, what it means is the extent to which an intervention program or policy actually continues to be used after implementation or adoption has, has been done. So in my mind, the way I think about it is if, if that innovation, practice, policy, whatever it is, becomes part of routine care, in my mind, this is the epitome of sustainability. It means that now this can go on without any having to worry about um, some challenges, to resource challenges, whatever the challenges that may be to sustainability. This is what we're trying to aim for in sustainability. It's a very important implementation outcome, and I'm going to describe that in a minute. Um, because we know that if the intervention is not implementable, it cannot be sustained. So that it's a very important, and, and, and it goes the other way as well. And unfortunately, it's a relatively neglected um, part of KT and implementation. And it's either if if it's not a, it's either not addressed or it's not addressed early enough. And so, why is sustainability important? So. This is another staggering statistic, unfortunately, is that up to 40% of all new programs don't last beyond the, the first two years after initial funding. So no wonder that you know, this is another um, contributor to research waste. So we've got to do a better job at, at thinking about um, sustainability because without that capacity, we're not going to be able to make those uh, public health impacts um, that, that we're aiming for and striving so hard for. And it actually may actually decrease quality of, of care as well. So I wanted to just talk about the relationship between implementation and sustainability is really important. And the way I practice KT, I always think of implementation and sustainability together. And I think that it's a really great way of thinking about it um, because it can be assessed at a different uh, stages of research and should be assessed at different stages of, of research. So one is at very early on in the process of developing whatever that innovation is, because we need to assess the potential 
the, the implementation and sustainability potential of that innovation first. And that has to be done at the beginning. And we wanna do it um, before we actually implement whatever this thing is. And we wanna do it while we're developing whatever the thing that we're developing is. So that's when I think one of the most important parts of when, oops, apologies for that. Um, that's when the most important part of, 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 of the next steps of that innovation is assessing that potential. And then the second uh, part where you really need to pay attention to it is to, during the evaluation phase. So once you've implemented um, your innovation, you wanna be able to evaluate whether, how well this was implemented and sustained. So those are, are two very important um, things to remember. So the relationship between these two activities is very complex and it requires um, uh, a very systematic process. The most important part is to develop a plan to ensure that optimized implementation and sustainability. We need to assess the readiness of the organization, the people that will implement it and the knowledge users, because some organizations or teams may not be ready for it yet. And that's a very, it's a key piece of information to know about before you attempt to actually go through this exhaustive process of implementing something. And then the most important part is to assess the factors that may influence implementation and sustainability. And the way we do that is we talk to people, we talk to the implementers, we talk to the organization, the people that make decisions about change within an organization. We talk to the knowledge users. So everyone involved in that implementation and change, um, we need to figure out what could be the potential barriers and facilitators to that. And of course, then we would execute that plan. That, that's, this is when we would conduct some of these studies and then to evaluate implementation and sustainability. So um, scalability is another really important um, activity. And it's really that ability to expand the reach of, of these effective innovations um, that have been implemented in one setting to another setting. But the key part to this is to, um, you know, to, to have that effectiveness remain when we're doing those adaptations. And that's where scalability can become a little bit challenging. So let's dig this into a little deeper. Um, so the, the, the reason that scalability is so important is because this will be the only way that we can achieve those health impacts. We need to reach larger populations. We can't have these, these small pockets of excellence um, where it works in a small setting. We need to reach larger uh, uh, population groups to really be able to say that we can um, have an impact on care. And again, just like with implementation and sustainability, scalability is relatively neglected, which can also lead to implementation failure or decay. So, and oftentimes we're constrained by our, our funding structure for this, but I think it's starting to improve and we're starting to be able to um, uh, convince our funders that, that we need dedicated funding just to be able to do this work. So again, it's not addressed or not addressed early enough. And again, this, this you know, enormous amount of effort that we put into developing these innovations, implementing and evaluating these innovations, but then we wanted to, be able to reach as many people as, as, as we can. Otherwise it will, it will, it will die and it will, it will you, know, you know, contribute to that, that research waste that I was talking about. So that's a very important step. So what is needed for effective scale up? Again, planning is very important. Adaptation of the innovations, the fit with existing way of doing things. So we need to really be able to understand the characteristics of the innovation that's being scaled up the implementers of, of that scale up, including identifying them and how to support those people, and as well as the adopting community and the context and how do we accommodate their environments, their needs, the socio-political situation, and doing all of this while retaining the effectiveness of the innovation. So it's a very, very important step to be able to identify all these factors. And then of course, using monitoring and evaluation data to inform that process. So lastly, I just wanted to mention, and I, I think I've alluded to um, evaluation along the way, 
that it's important uh, to evaluate all KT activities. So all of the, one, the ones that I mentioned, there's different types of evaluations that I'm sure you've heard of efficacy where we're trying to look at what works, effectiveness research, which we often do for KT is does it work under real world conditions? And then process evaluation, also very important in KT. Economic evaluation, again, incredibly important to figure out whether what we're doing is feasible and what is the cost effectiveness. And then end user perceptions, <clears throat> excuse me. So we need to do evaluation because we need to know whether, you know, are, are we successful? Is this worth our investment? Um, and <clears throat> by doing an evaluation, we, you know, we need to also <clears throat> provide a rationale for why this, this is needed and why it needs to be scaled up. Excuse me. <laughs> so if something is not working, <clears throat> evaluation will really help us guide what needs to be changed or adjusted. So this is very important information that we need to be able to move forward. And these are some questions that, that can be considered for evaluation planning. So then now I'm going to just close um, this session by, you know, putting all of this together to show you a worked example of, of how, you know, a team would consider all of these different activities and, and how they, they develop their innovation. So I'm going to use a case example that was actually uh, developed by one of the investigators at Diabetes uh, Action Canada, Dr. Catherine Yu, <clears throat> who conducted a study, a series of study, um, in fact, over the last four, four years or so, to create and evaluate a decision aid called My Diabetes uh, Plan. And the goals of this decision aid were to help people living with diabetes make more informed decisions about available treatment options, and to be able to indiv individualize the care priorities from both the patient and provider perspective. So I, 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 if, you, if you recall, I, I talked about decisions, decision aids and shared decision making as one of our interactive uh, strategies. So this is an example of, of that kind of strategy. So let's take that um, example. And before I, I, I dig into the details, I just wanted to acknowledge that this um, decision aid was actually developed using one of those knowledge translation frameworks that I, I mentioned earlier, the knowledge to action model. But that also maps very nicely to these activities that I just described. But I just wanted to just acknowledge that it is based on this, this model, but I will describe it in terms of the different KT activities that I just um, highlighted to you. So again, in terms of all the different activities, the very first thing that this team did was uh, their integrated KT team. So they assemble a team of patients living with diabetes, some healthcare professionals that are involved in uh, caring for, for these patients, and they met every two months or so to steer the project. So in terms of knowledge creation, the very first thing that this group did was reviewed the literature. So they looked at some systematic reviews, uh, uh, decision aids, you know, what are the, the things that work well for them. They've done some, some work on their own by um, interviewing uh, patients living with diabetes and healthcare professionals. And they used all of that knowledge to then create a prototype of this My Diabetes Plan decision aid. And then what they did was they tested that, it's called a usability evaluation with um, patients uh, living with diabetes as well as healthcare professionals to actually refine that prototype. So then what they did was um, they developed an implementation and sustainability plan and they ex executed this plan um, to primary care, care practices at some uh, about 10 family uh, uh, primary care practices or family health teams um, to see whether or not, and they it conducted an evaluation study to test the feasibility and effectiveness, as well as the process of implementing this, um, of this innovation. And then although this team, um, I think they're thinking about scalability, but I just wanted to illustrate that part of next steps now would be to scale up this plan or this, this um, 
uh, decision aid across additional primary care practices. For example, other family health teams in the GTA or even across the Ontario health teams that we have now. So this is that kind of that process that you would take to take it to that another level. And of course, to be able to evaluate that implementation more broadly at that point. So where does dissemination come in? So dissemination is one of those activities that you could, you could do across the board. So this team actually had five <clears throat> publications across all of these studies. So they published their protocols, they published the, the results after each of these, these different studies that they did, when they created the knowledge, when they implemented and evaluated uh, the knowledge. So there's lots of um, these types of activities, these passive dissemination, as well as interactive dissemination activities that they did throughout. So they created knowledge products, um, you know, with, with their um, uh, knowledge users, um, you know, they, they created plain language summaries, infographics, they tailored some of those messages. So they did all of those things throughout the process. And then finally, in terms of evaluation, again, evaluation was a component across all of these activities. So you could evaluate the effectiveness of the collaboration. So <clears throat> their integrated KT team can be evaluated iteratively as you go through the project. Is it working? Are we involving is particularly the importance of making sure that we involve the patient partner knowledge users at every step we often do these evaluations during the integrated KT teams to make sure that we are empowering and engaging patient partners adequately and in the right way so that they feel that they are empowered to continue contributing to the research project. So we can you know, do different things. We can <clears throat> uh, administer a survey after each integrated KT meeting. We can have a discussion about the results. And whatever feedback we get, then we can adjust our processes for the next time so that we improve and we make that engagement a little bit more meaningful. And then this group also evaluated the feasibility of this decision aid, the usability, its effectiveness, all across the board as they were developing this, this tool. And of course, evaluating the implementation sustainability and scalability of the tool as, as you move across all of these different activities. So I just wanted to conclude um, by, you know, I, I, I really hope that after this, this, this presentation, you are able to define knowledge translation and the related concepts that I described, that you're able to sort of understand and describe why KT is important in health research, especially across all of those different activities that I mentioned, and to understand the you know, the nuances of those various KT activities that can be embedded uh, and, and done alongside any kind of research activity so that we can ensure its uptake in practice and policy. So with that, um, uh, I'm happy to, uh, thank you so much for, again, for attending this webinar, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Monica. And I, I think it's also worth mentioning, and I forgot in my introduction, that Monica is quite integrated into the Diabetes Action Canada programming. Uh, she co-leads our Knowledge Mobilization and Implementation Science core theme, and is also co-leading our, our training and mentoring um, gr group or program. So uh, as I mentioned before, when we kicked off today's webinar, I asked that any questions that people may have be placed in the question and answer box. And, um, oh, I see actually that somebody here has a hand up. So I'm going to actually allow that person to talk because uh, we have a small enough group today. So it looks like Geraldine uh, has a question for you, Monica. So Geraldine, I've asked you to unmute to ask your question. And perhaps while, while um, Geraldine's working through that, um, oh, it was an error, sorry. Uh, I can ask a question that has come through uh, as I was thinking um, when I was watching today's presentation, 
And that has a lot to do with knowledge translation and or mobilization, whichever term you decide to use, and how it's integrated into the research proposals that we put together, both at Diabetes Action Canada and outside and external to the organization. And Monica, I just wanted to ask you, what is your number one observation or, or, or what do you see as the number one mistake that researchers do uh, when they're working through their proposals uh, when it comes to knowledge translation or knowledge mobilization? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And I think it's really a, a couple of things. One is I think it's really important that the team talk about the strategy. So they, you know, they, you know, it's, I think that, you know, the principal investigator may have some ideas of what's possible, but I think talking to the team really reveals the type of networks that you could tap into to be able to optimize the dissemination of knowledge. So I think that um, having a discussion, oftentimes we have, uh, when we start formulating a team, even for a grant proposal, for example, we like to have a meeting you know, to discuss all of those things. And that's when you can often reveal some of those, um, those missing pieces or some of those opportunities to get creative with, you know, you know, going beyond the passive dissemination strategies. And then once you start the project and you have that first initial integrated KT meeting, that's when you can also identify any additional networks that you could, you could tap into. Is there anyone missing from the table that we should also connect with? And I think it's very important to to develop this plan collaboratively. And I think that that's potentially, and I mean, oftentimes, I mean, I think we're constrained by time, right? It's not always possible. It's not always optimal to get together with a large group of people. But at the very least, I think we can start with some sort of, and I think the template really helps too, because it asks the right questions to sort of get your mind thinking through what could be potential strategies. But also just in some way, you know, uh, having a smaller group of people maybe develop a plan and then share it with others to see if there's any other things that, that they could add. But I think having a plan and having a discussion with the team is, is important. Thanks, Monica. Um, I see there is a question in the chat from Erin. Um, wondering how the 80% research waste calculation was arrived at. Repeating research results is often viewed as helpful, if not essential. <laughs> yeah, so this this was a, a, a paper that was uh, published uh, back in uh, 2007 by Chalmers. If you look up, I think I left the, the references there, it was published in The Lancet. And um, it, was, uh, it was a very shocking uh, <laughs> um, article when it came out. And I think it's it does have, and it explains, I think it highlights um, not only from my perspective, the lack of implementation, but also the, the lack of rigor and the methods that we use to, to create research. I think it also highlighted that as a problem. And um, so there's a whole bunch of different things that are discussed in those papers. I really encourage you to uh, read, read that. But, um, and so since then, I think there has been a lot more effort put into to address this problem but it persists. So there's uh, several papers that have been published since then to address this problem because they want to continue having that conversation. I think it's it when it, it it was brought to the forefront, I think it shocked a lot of people. And um, I think there's been a lot of different things that have been put into place. A lot of journals have adopted certain um, processes and procedures to ensure that, that we do have that rigor and research. So there's been a lot of things that have been done over the years to address it, but we could still do better. And I think that from my own personal view, KT and implementation science is the key to reducing that research waste as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have another question while we wait for anyone else who might be interested in asking some uh, to put it into the question and answer box. Uh, you know, we always talk, uh, especially at the research network level, about the importance of scale and spread for our research outcomes. And that always seems to be um, very easily planable, but not very easily actionable. And, and I talk about that when it comes to connecting with a lot of policy and decision makers. So my question, uh, well, actually, my, yeah, my question here is, what is your advice in that regard? Yeah, so again, I think, I think if there's one message that I, 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 I should convey, to everyone, it's it's about planning. 
planning is the key to everything. And I think planning early and then using tools to help you plan, to using your, your, your team as a way of, of helping that plan. I think that planning is the most important part. Um, we often do things haphazardly at the, at the end or in the middle, uh, we forget about something or it's, it, you know, it's the nature of the way, you know, we, we've, we do research and we're, we're so strapped for time and, and resources that it, it's not always the most um, ideal, but I think planning and using templates and, and uh, very systematic strategies is, is the key. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Monica. Um, I oh, guess sorry. one one sorry one mm -hmm. one other thing I wanted to mention that is it's not always uh, it's not always um, necessary to scale to like everything. So I just wanted to mention that first of all, we only want to you know scale innovations that have been shown to work and they're effective and cost effective, and it's not always necessary or or reasonable to scale. So it's only for those kinds of innovations that are ready to be scaled and are effective and cost effective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see um, uh, Doug actually um, has his hand up. And so I've allowed him to speak. And if, if Doug, you'd like to unmute uh, to ask your question, uh, you are welcome to do so. Well, I just wait for, for Doug to perhaps work out the, the technology there. Uh, I have another question here. Um, you mentioned as KT activity newsletter and publish results in scientific papers, one of the objectives is to do research is to publish a paper and the majority of people don't open the newsletter. So I'm wondering whether to put my energy to do real, really KT with partners or reach different, differently to the, to the public. Uh so it's a question around, um, so publications, so we may start off with a scientific publication, but I think if you wanna reach, reach a wider and more specialized audience, we need to take that publication and we need to unpack it <clears throat> for the right audience. And you know, so you can have the same paper research results but um, create a different knowledge product depending on the audience group. So we may end up, you know, depending on your audience group, if, if you were uh, looking at, you know, creating, you know, a lay language summary or an infographic for, you know, patient groups or policymakers or even researchers, because a lot of researchers do like the, the plain language summaries as well. It's all about creating um, a type of re <clears throat> knowledge product that, it best can best reflect that those results in the way that they 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 can best understand it and by the the right messenger. So it's all about um, tailoring and customizing that those key information pieces or recommendations um, for your audience group. So if it if it goes out into the community, then it's like what is the best way of getting that across, and what's the best vehicle? You know is you know, who's going to be reading that? Is it social media? Is it, you know, so it all depends on your audience group. It depends on um, what is it that you're trying to get across. And um, I think it's really around that customization. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. And if I could add, I think it's a lot about different, different pieces for different groups. And I think you mentioned that, Monica, but I did want to reiterate that if your key audience is our patient partners, then a scientific publication is not the best mm -hmm. um, the best way to, to to get that information to that group. Whereas uh, a small blog post or a newsletter or some other type of lay summary uh, might be uh, more appropriate. So uh, I think that's a really important distinction. Um, so the, our next question is from Aaron, but quite possibly from uh, Dr. Rob Screeton. Um, so any thoughts on how best to incorporate KT and patient engagement in fundamental research? Seems like there are real challenges that are unique to the areas of research and real opportunities. Oh, and this was in fact by uh, Rob Screeton. So thank you, Rob. Uh, so by fundamental research, I'm assuming you're talking about, you know, the more basic research. What I would say, yeah, wet lab. Basic um, science research. Lab. Basic science research, okay. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is a, a really interesting area that I think um, we haven't paid enough attention to. And I think it all goes back to um, figuring out what is, 
that group, how, like what is it that, that they think is important in terms of getting their research results out? So it may be very, very different than let's say, you know, doing health services research. So it could be about, you know, you know, it may be about, you know, ensuring that you've got the right people around the table that you may not even think about, but it may be related more, more to the dissemination of knowledge. So who do we have around the table that can then take whatever we find in our research to, to let people know about it, to be more aware about it so that they'll use it. So, and then your, your knowledge users might be very different than in health re services research, but the, the actual um, implementation may be very different because in health services research, it's very challenging because we're, we're dealing with behavior change. Where in, uh, I think, <clears throat> I'm assuming in, in uh, basic science research, behavior change may not be as big of a factor when you're implementing something. <clears throat> so I'm thinking like a medication, a device, you know, you, it's, it's a, a lot easier to uh, implement something like that if it doesn't involve behavior change. However, if it does be involve behavior change, then there's lots of opportunities to incorporate some of the activities that I mentioned. So it all depends on um, the audience group, you know, the dissemination, and then the implementation needs of whatever innovation that you're creating. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I, I can actually, you know, expand a bit on that. Uh, as we're learning within Diabetes Action Canada, how best to take some of the complex research that we're doing and what's really important and what people actually respond to, uh, there is a lot of desire to take these very complex, especially basic science type publications and make them digestible and easy to understand. So a lot of these academic publications do end at the publication stage where I think it's that extra couple of steps that need to be done to make a lay summary, then get that summary into news outlets and then get those news outlets to the attention of different groups, including funders and policy policy makers and other groups. So, you know, this is becoming a very interesting um, area uh, for us as well as we're starting to take a multifaceted approach to knowledge translation and mobilization. I, I, I use both terms because I don't know which one is the, <laughs> it's, it's the one most recognized by the group. Um, so I don't see any more questions here. I'm going to give Doug, uh, I see your hand is still up. I'm going to give you one more opportunity to see if you can, can say, uh, see. So can you hear me this time? I can hear you now. Yes. Wonderful. I just wanted to comment that I've drawn to this because I've just become involved in a research project and it's three phases. And one of the three phases is dissemination behavioral change. And I was really encouraged to see those words. And really that's my role in the project. So I'm quite excited about what I've learned today and I'm looking forward to what you have in the future. Thank you. And, and thank, yes, and thank you for that comment, Doug. I appreciate it. And I think that's a great way to end today's webinar. So I, I just wanna thank Monica on behalf of Diabetes Action Canada uh, for coming out today and speaking about this very important topic. Uh, this, is going, this is a recorded webinar. Uh, after today, we will have this recording available on our website and I will send it out broadly to the group. Uh, we will also be sending out a needs assessment survey in knowledge translation to everyone who attended today, as well as the Diabetes Action Canada community broadly, to see what we need to hit on in our next webinar and workshop. Uh, we would like to get a whole webinar and workshop series together so that everyone does have the tools that they need in order to get their um, knowledge translation and mobilization plans together. So I think this is all a, a very important stepping stone. And I want to thank everybody for their time today and uh, wishing you all a very happy holiday. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.